Hello everybody and welcome back to a brand new video. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at the 2022 Senate elections from the perspective of a few seats that I think are actually competitive and from some seats that I think are not really that competitive. So uh, we're just going to get right into this one. I do want to say for starters that like, or obviously it would be cheating for me to put like Nevada as like truly competitive because it's like, well, no, duh. And like, I think that would be kind of unfair analysis because like everyone knows that it's kind of, you know, pretty obvious. So I'll be doing some states that I think people are like, you know, there's actually like a debate about. Um, and yeah, so we're just going to get right into it here. So the first state that will be truly competitive is Arizona. Arizona, there have been a lot of Democrats, especially who think Mark Kelly has it in the bag. You know, they say, oh, well, the polls right now show him up by five. And even if you apply 2020 style polling error, he would still win. And that's true. And that's why I think that he's pretty clearly favored right now. But the polls have been, you know, the gas been closing. He was up by 8% last month. He's now up by, you know what, a little under five. And yes, you know, he's leading in Republican internals. I think him being up in Trafalgar, which had Trump winning the state in 2020, same with insider advantage and coefficient too. That's pretty good for him. But like that being said, I would still be pretty surprised if he won by like more than, you know, three, four points. Um, there's a real chance that Hispanic turnout is collapses in Arizona. We have very preliminary early vote numbers that doesn't seem to be happening, but it could happen. Uh, there's also always a chance the suburbs swing hard against Democrats this year just because of down ballot lag. And while, again, that's not the outcome I'd bet on, it is possible. And so I think Arizona is a very elastic state. A lot can happen here. And I wouldn't count Blake Masters out just yet, even though I think it's pretty clear that Mark Kelly is the favorite in this race. Now, our first fool's gold state is Ohio. Ohio has gotten like a lot of attention because it's you know gotten decently close over these past you know few weeks and months, I guess you could say. But I think it's a bit of a mirage. If you look at the twenty uh, tw the 2022 Senate polls, Tim, R or Tim Ryan is basically in the same spot Joe Biden was in. He's down by about a point, and we all know how that worked out for Joe Biden. He lost by 8%, and Ryan, if you apply 2020 polling error, would be on track to lose by about the same amount. Now, as we know, polls in midterms are a lot more accurate than in uh, presidential elections, so I think that's part of it. And Senate polls in Ohio haven't been nearly as cursed as presidential polls. That being said, there's still pretty clearly going to be a polling miss, and Tim Ryan can't really actually, you know, do well in actual polls. Like, you know, Signal, which is a Republican poll, but they've been pretty good in the Midwest, has him down. Um, DFP, uh, I don't really like DFP. Like, Emerson, I think, is a good poll, has him down, but he's only at 45%, and most of these undecideds are Republicans. Uh, Siena is also pretty good. They have him leading by three, but he's only at 46, and again, most of those undecideds are going to break for Vance. Same thing with Marist. He's at 45, but... Most of us having a break for Vance. Like the like the thing with Ryan's polling leads and like actual polls are that you know they're good for him, but he's you know he's still only up by, um you know we're, he's still only at like forty five forty six percent, and most of those undecideds are going to break for JD Vance if they had as, as they have done historically. So um unless you think the polls know how are, are going to become like a lot more accurate a lot quickly or really quickly, uh I don't see a path for Tim Ryan. The math just really isn't there for him. He'd have to get. Historically good, uh, historically high numbers from Democrats in Cleveland uh, and Columbus. Keep up the trends in the Cincinnati and Columbus suburbs while also making gains in Republican trending areas. It's just not a coalition that like, seems to be coming together for Democrats right now. And I think Vance can win by six or seven points at the end of the day. And I think a lot of people are going to be surprised by how by how lopsided the margin is. I know a lot of people I know think that it's it's going to be you know close. You know Tim Ryan won't win, but like oh it'll be close. They say. But the thing is, I don't even think that's the case. I think Tim Ryan's going to go down by you know six, seven points, and it will be called earlier than a lot of people think on election night. Now, truly competitive state number two, that's Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania, I think, is just the race this year that's broke everyone's brains. Um, a lot of Republicans are like, how can John Fetterman win? He's far left. He, he's unelectable. He can't form a, you know, he can't string a sentence together. Then Republicans are like, or then Democrats are like, how can Dr. Oz win? He literally kills puppies. He is not from Pennsylvania. Everyone hates him. His fa fa favorables are terrible. And I think both those cases are just blinded by partisanship. I think both Fetterman and Oz are lackluster candidates. I think Fetterman's a bit better in terms of electability, and he's running a bit stronger of a campaign. But, like, this is a Republican-leaning year. Pennsylvania will be, you know, they will elect Republican senators. And there are real concerns about Fetterman's candidacy, especially in the Philadelphia area. Now, having Josh Shapiro on the ballot is a big booster for John Fetterman because it basically caps how badly he can do in Philadelphia. Additionally, Fetterman does have appeal to a lot – of working class voters that you know m might be Democratic down ballot but voted for Trump in 2020. So I think um, there's a like there are a lot of conflicting reports in this state. Like the polls have gotten really bad for Fetterman. If you look at where we're at right now, he's only up by 2.2 percent. And yes, we like the, like those recent polls we have are Republican pollsters. That being said, 
um th there's still been some narrowing especially like echelon which has like seen a 10 point gap close in the past three months um you know Suffolk has it decently close um emerson has it you know quite close and they were pretty good in pennsylvania too they over they overestimated biden by exactly the amount they have Fetterman up by so you know in a lot of the, these polls if you apply a 2020 uh, style polling miss Fetterman would, would either be like really close or even losing i think in emerson for example he'd actually be down by like half a point so it, it's going to be close i think it comes down to how how much oz can outperform mastriano by in the philadelphia suburbs and in the city itself if it's by a lot he'll probably win if it's by you know, if he gets dragged out with Mastriano, it's going to be a rough night for Republicans in Pennsylvania. So going to be close either way. I think anyone telling you this race is like likely D or likely R is, you know, either coping or just lying to you. So our next state, our fool's gold state here is Wisconsin. It's another Midwestern state. It's actually a final Midwestern state of the video. But, um, you know, look, this state, I, I think, could have been competitive. And actually, in, in, early, in very early 2021, this is like April or May, I think, I did actually have this race as a pure toss up. Um, but. Here's the thing with these, if I can find it here, with these states, especially in Wisconsin, the polls are terrible for Democrats. Ron Johnson's up by three points right now, okay, right? And so um, if, if you were to apply to 2020-style polling list to Wisconsin, it would go for him by like 10 points. It would not even be close. Now, in fairness to Mandela Barnes, Wisconsin polls tend to be quite accurate in midterms. I actually don't think that'll continue. I think they're going to undershoot Republicans again. But if you apply 2018-style polling list, Ron Johnson would win by like three and a half or four. So it would be a bit, you know, it'd be a lot smaller of a polling miss. Now, um, I do want to say, I think Mandela Barnes is going to get, you know, kind of squashed in the uh, working class areas. He's probably going to get um, pretty poor numbers and with rural voters, especially as polarization down ballot lag catches up to the Democrats in those areas. And the Wow Kennys have always liked Ron Johnson. I don't see why they turn against him now. So Mandela Barnes, I think, can get 47, but I think those next, you know, two or three points are pretty Herculean, and I don't really see a path for him at this point, maybe a few months ago, but He's, you know, getting blitzed on the ads and is, I'm going to have a hard time seeing him uh, catching up in these final few weeks. And I think most Democrats have privately conceded that they're not going to win Wisconsin. So I think anyone, you know, still think this race is a toss up is, uh, you know, lagging behind here. So our final truly competitive state that I think there's a recognition here is going to be North Carolina. This is a hot take, right? Um, and I, by the way, Nevada is by all means more competitive than North Carolina. So like I will put it down, but I actually don't want to like really talk about it as much because I think, again, we all know that. North Carolina is interesting, and I don't mean like it will be less close than these, than these other three states, but there's a lot of room for things to happen. So right now, the the first we only have information for the third, for the first three days of early vote. Um, like we're getting really mixed signals. The first day was pretty good for Republicans, but especially this final day was quite good for Democrats. And like they're outpacing their 2018 numbers in some areas, and they're underperforming their 2018 numbers in other areas. I do think that there's going to be, um. A, a drop in turnout from the white Republican rural areas, especially in Appalachia, which is going to hurt Ted Budd. But Shari Beasley has a big task ahead of her, which would be to boost black turnout. So I think I could see Budd winning by six and a half. I could also see him losing if things get really bad for Republicans between now and Election Day. Now, that isn't me saying he's going to lose. I still think he's pretty clearly favored at this point. But I do think that this race is more competitive than a lot of other states. So um, I guess I'll do two just to make this map a bit more even. I'll do two fools, fools gold states. Uh, the first fool's gold state that we'll be doing here is Iowa. And I know I said that I wouldn't do any Midwestern states after this, but I changed my mind. I should do want to do Iowa because I gave myself room for my final one. Um, I Look, Iowa is going to like be very strong for Mike, for, excuse me, for Chuck Grassley. Right now, the polls have him up by a lot smaller of an amount than you'd expect him to be up by. So he's up by 6.9% of the aggregate. And, you know, people have been really panicking about his chances because of this one sells poll. Again, Selzer is like the gold standard of Iowa polls. He's always been really good at this. And they nailed 2020, they nailed 2018, they nailed 2016. They've always, you know, gotten it right. And they're only showing Grassley up by three. So I think that did make, like make my expectations a bit more bearish on him. But he's still going to win by like, you know, 10, 12 points. I think the people who think it's actually competitive just because of one Selzer poll are kind of, you know, um, not fully looking at the big picture. Most of the undecides in this poll are going to break for Grassley, and I think self his final final poll is going to be like Grassley plus eleven. I think he'll win by a similar amount. So Iowa, uh, uh, plus the fact that the polls in Iowa, other than that, tend to underestimate Republicans big time. So I think he'll be fine either way. Now, our final fool's gold state is Washington, and I did not like. I would not have believed I would have had to have like the actually Washington is not competitive conversation with people like a year ago, but I guess I do. So uh, there's been a Republican obsession with Washington like for like a few months, and I don't really know why. It's mostly because Rick Scott, who the, who's the um, NRSC chair, has like you know been 
like saying, oh, well, we can win Washington. And I think he's mostly just saying that just to get Smiley some donations. But the thing is, um, if you look at the polls, none of them actually have Smiley within reach. Her own internal has her down by like, I think, five points. Yeah, and this is back from June. And the environment's gone worse for Republicans since then. Even like Trafalgar, which is a pretty funny poll uh, that consistently overestimates Republican support, has her down by two. This is like the best poll they could have gotten for her. That's still pretty bad. And then, you know, all, all, all the nonpartisan polls survey at USA has her down by eight. Civics has her down by 14. Emerson has her down by nine. PPP has her down by 12. Um, I don't know LA, but I think they're nonpartisan. They have her down by 13. So those average out to like a double digit victory for Murray. I think she went by under 15. I think Smiley is a decent candidate for Republicans, but King Cantor looks pretty good for Democrats. Um, I expect them to do, you know, decently well with rural voters compared to what they did in 2020. And I just think Smiley's a bit overrated at this point. So Washington's our final fool's gold state. Now, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you, uh, or, uh, sorry, I hope you enjoyed. Um, comment down below what you think. Do you think any of these states that I put as green are actually yellow? Do you think any of these yellow states are actually green? I know there may be some disagreements here. I know a lot of people think that Ohio and North Carolina should be reversed, for example. I know a lot of people think that Wisconsin is still competitive, but uh, let's talk about it. So thanks for watching. Um, leave a like, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all tomorrow.